Right, today is September the 13th in 2023, and I have two previous guests on the show. In fact, two of the most pop from two is the most popular episodes of this podcast. So, first one is Sebastian Brunemeyer, the general partner of Healthspan Capital and CEO of Immunage Pharma, is back. Yeah. And Robert Hansel, of course, professor yeah. of economics at George Mason University and iconic thinker. Come back, Robin. Nice to see you. Fantastic. I wanted to have both of you back on the show because of several puzzles in my mind. Through Sebastian, I got very involved with longevity biotech, movement to fight aging and death. We had previous, we had several guests on the show about that. We have ambitious goals. We want to make people live radically longer and healthier. However, the healthcare market is not delivering outcomes we would expect given the amount of money and talent in the field. Right, about 20% of GDP and the best and brightest from leading medical schools are working on that stuff and we're not really improving much. Robin did some fascinating work on hitting motives and human behavior and insights from health economics are at the core of it. Maybe doctors don't actually sell health. Maybe we don't actually want to be healthy. A lot of healthcare is produced and delivered around a signaling motive and not actually improving health. This made me think that we have a lot to solve for if we want to get longevity right. We can't do it only the old ways of making drugs and distributing them through various providers and insurance themes. We have to think of many new solutions. Robin, can you kick us off by talking a bit about your surprising findings from healthcare economics? So just to be clear, uh, what I'm about to tell you is just widely known in health economics. It just doesn't tend to make it outside the field of health economics. And uh, there's a sense in which people are in somewhat denial about it. Um, the, the, you know, we have many kinds of evidence. So um, obviously we've got millions of medical articles, uh, even like a million per year or something published all the time. And each particular article in a medical journal is typically about some particular kind of treatment. And most of them give the impression that they help. So that sort of evidence would suggest medicine is this vast source of help and that the 18% of GDP we spend on it would be very useful, right? Um, however, uh, if you look at say histor historians of science and medicine, uh, they, when they try to attribute changes in lifespan and mortality over time to various causes, they tend to give medicine a minor contribution, even though it's, we spend a lot more on it than we do on say nutrition or, or, um, uh, you know, sanitation, things like that. And then if you look at the very best data we have about the effect of medicine, which is a very small fraction of all of the studies of medicine, uh, that would be randomized trials where we randomly take some people and we induce them to get more medicine overall on average by basically giving them a cheaper price. Uh, we have half dozen sort of randomized trial experiments like that. And they consistently give the answer that the people we induce to get more medicine are not healthier overall. And that's pretty surprising. Uh, that is, we're spending this huge amount of medicine. So this is uh, true in the United States among ordinary people, among poor people. That's true in this, in other places like India, uh, and most health economists or medical experts, they tend to be puzzled by this and they tend to, they find some other studies that are lower quality data, but then they find variation. They say, oh, see, I'm seeing effect here. There must be something wrong with that. And if you talk to health economists, they will agree that our very best data, the randomized trials, uh, are showing no marginal effect basically, uh, with, you know, pretty high confidence in the, in the bounds of how big an effect that could be. And it could be a small effect. It just can't be a big one. Um, but they also agree, well, look, oh, there's all these other studies we've done. Look at all these other studies and how, you know, how promising they sing. There's this meta statistics, uh, literature about how we have publication bias and other biases in our literature, which, you know, basically the usual sort of headline claims is like most published claims are false because of these statistical selection problems, which is a reason to like go for your strongest, best data. Uh, but so then my, my contribution is just to ask, well, how do we explain this? So I'm more of a social science theorist saying, how could we make sense 
of this. And to do that, you want to combine this with a bunch of other things we might know about medicine and health. And so notice, for example, that people are very obsessed with medicine compared to other, there's a bunch of other things that do have plausible substantial correlations with health, air quality, exercise, sleep, you know, sanitation, even, uh, but people are not very motivated or interested in those things. They, they, they quickly lose interest, but medicine they're obsessed with, and they really care a lot about making sure everybody gets enough medicine. And then the various other clues about medicine suggest to me and my co-author and others that it's about showing that we care. That is, we, we're using that. We really rely on medicine as something, as a sign of whether the people care about us, whether they're willing to spend money on medicine, spend money to being with us when we're sick, uh, doing things for us. And we want other people to show that they care about us so that everybody sees that we have people who are, care about us. We want to be known to be cared for. And um, that's basically why on the margin medicine does help. Uh, now, you might think, you got to need a little more of the story. Like, well, surely we would like want it to help, wouldn't we? But like, when you, when you only have a limited number of things that are useful, you can do, and you want to do a lot more to show you can help, then you'd have to dig into all the things that are not very useful. Uh, and I think one of the things that most people don't get, but it's just worth mentioning is that most people often assume that medicine is either useful or useless. And they forget the third category of harmful. The reason why on the margin medicine uh, has no net effect has to be because it's a mixture of stuff that helps and stuff that hurts. Because uh, we do know there's a bunch of stuff that helps. I mean, I'm happy to go through the list and point to specific things that clear, seem to me clearly to help. But on the margin, if it's overall not helping, then there's got to, and we do know some specific things that hurt. Uh, so we can go through those if you want. I think I've said yeah, enough please, for my if intro. You, if you can talk a bit about these, uh, if you can see what you find has is harmful versus what's good versus what's neutral. Maybe Sebastian can follow up on that afterwards because he's a practitioner, right? So he has also a lot to say about the same question. So, I mean, it seems like, for example, you know, if you get a gunshot, I'm going to tell you, get some medicine. Hey, um, you get a broken leg, you know, broken arm. Yeah. You probably want some medicine, right? Um, certainly, you know, eyeglasses work. Um, you know, so, so babe, infant, young infants who, uh, have in problems at birth and, um, those are, you know, and so basically these are kind of what you might think of as the obvious cases where, you know, people are in substantial distress and medicine comes in and does something. And yes, it looks like they help there. And of course, then there's things like vaccines, uh, preventive treatment like that. They do seem to help on average. Um, but so part of the issue is marginal versus average medicine. That is, uh, these studies I talked about, they look at the effect of the medicine that some people get that other people don't. Um, it's much harder to look at the effect of the medicine that everybody gets. And so many of these kinds of medicine are medicine that pretty much everybody gets. And so then it's harder to see the marginal effect, but obviously when we're spending 20% on GDP, there's a whole bunch of stuff that a lot of people are getting that other people are. Great. Sebastian, can you talk Agreed. a bit about, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'm in alignment, uh, on everything said so far. Um, intuitively it, it makes sense, you know, being in the biotech and biomedical research field, a lot of the drugs don't really seem to work as promised or as hoped, and many of them are harmful. I saw a statistic that the fourth leading cause of death in the United States is properly prescribed medicine, properly prescribed medication. <laughs> and if you've ever hung out in a hospital, unless it's the most elite hospital, uh, you know, you're kind of surprised by the level of incompetence and disorganization and so forth. So you'd expect the same by, by properly level described, of rigor. You mean um, drugs that they were supposed to prescribe, that they correctly prescribe? Yes, that are part of the standard of care, that doctors uh, are all obliged to follow this checklist, where if you get sick with disease X, your medical guidelines say that you have to prescribe drug Y. And if that drug doesn't work, then you go to the next drug and the next drug in a sequence. Um, and so some, some disciplines of medicine are a lot more prescriptive than others. 
uh, where the doctors have a little bit more leeway. But like in oncology, it's very stereotyped. Um, and, and so there's really not a lot of room for medical innovation there. And we know throughout the history of medicine, a lot of innovations have occurred where doctors are trying something new. Um, and if you have to wait until you've tried four different things, and maybe one of those four things ultimately killed your patient before you can try the fifth new thing, um, medical innovation is not going to advance as rapidly. So, um, yeah, there was an important point that Robin, you mentioned, uh, about some medicines being good and, and some being bad, and it kind of washes out to zero <laughs> statistical effect. Um, and, and there's a, a further point, which is some medicines are actually good for you in the short term, but bad for you in the long term. Like chemotherapy comes to mind. Yeah, it can delay the progression of your tumor for a little while, but it leaves you without a functional immune system because traditional chemotherapy does DNA damage and kills fast dividing cells, including the immune system, which is hosts your fastest dividing cells. So long term, you may be worse off. Um, and, and there are many examples of that symptom palliation type drugs like um, anti-inflammatory agents or immune suppressive agents or painkillers that cause more serious side effects down the road. Um, and, and we don't really detect that in the long term. If we make an analogy to auto repair, uh, you know, which is about repairing automobiles, uh, you might ask, would we expect a randomized trial to show that no, no benefit on cars of auto repairs on the margin? <laughs> I, I would be surprised by that. I, I do know that there's a lot of treatment that you get in auto repair that you don't need, but I still would guess that if you, you know, cars would be lasting longer if they got more auto repair on the margin. So that suggests there's something especially going wrong with medicine. Mm -hmm. Uh, compared, so similarly say housing repair or whatever, right? If you, if you on the margin cut back on housing repair, I expect your houses won't last as long, you know, pipe repair, et cetera. Right. So make maintenance, maintenance of various sorts. In fact, like in government, it's a standard trope that government is willing to fund new things, but not so much fund the maintenance of them. And so when you build new government things, you just have to expect they're going to, you know, not do maintenance very well. And you have to build things robust to maintenance. That is. You build a government building, you just have to expect they're not going to be expecting it and repairing it as often as they should. And you just build it that way to, to be robust against that mistreatment. So then I'd expect that in fact, on the margin buildings, especially government buildings, you'd see an effect on the margin of if you took more care of them, they'd last longer. Um, so we should be surprised here about medicine, right? Something different. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it seems to be. It so seems to be trying to fix a problem late in the process. So um, it's not like medicine is really doing that much maintenance uh, or repair. There are diagnostics and so forth, but um, a lot of it is just a patient comes in with a very late stage pathology and you're trying to palliate the symptoms. It's not like often we're giving medicine that makes the person, the patient more robust to disease in the future, right? That's what we're we're developing right. in the longevity field, these drugs that are actually good for you, like rabamycin, for example. But most drugs is kind of an open secret in the field. If you give most drugs in the pharmacopoeia to a mouse for its whole lifespan, do you think it's going to increase or decrease the lifespan? On balance, it's going to decrease because drugs, the word pharmacology comes from the Greek pharmakon, which means poison. So most drugs are actually bad for you in the long term, but may give you some symptom palliation in the short term for a very specific disease. Many people over the decades have said we need to do more prevention rather than mm -hmm. treatment. And they've tried to promote many prevention regimes, but my understanding is they haven't panned out as being effective. That is the kind of prevention, you know, ordinary, like annual, annual checkups, for example, seems like annual checkups don't actually help. Uh, and. So that's also puzzling, right? You might, it would make sense to say, ah, we're waiting too late in the process. Let's do something early. But the people who try to do things earlier and offer those services, and then we do trial, you know, studies of them, it looks like they aren't helping. Hmm. Wow. That suggests something is something deeper is broken with the system. I mean, the fundamental assumptions about medicine, um, it, it would surprise me that if you show up for a checkup regularly, your doctor is more likely to detect something that went wrong. Well, one explanation is. They detect false signals. So they say, hey, right. your, your blood biomarker is out of, out of line. Let's put you on this drug. But the drug actually does more harm than the early detection does. 
it's kind of like similar with full body MRIs. So this is fashionable today. You can detect these tiny nascent tumors with a full body MRI, um, but it actually may create false negatives. And if you're doing a whole lot of surgeries to take out these benign tumors, uh, you may have more, more risk or, or damage of, you know, getting an infection or whatever than the actual tumor would have offered. I'm not sure the jury's still out on full body MRIs, but similar premise could apply elsewhere. I'm told the following, I'm, I wish I remember where I, I got the result, but the following is actually useful advice for our listeners with respect to medicine. So if you have some condition, you often have a choice to go to a big hospital or a small hospital. And here's three facts about the difference between supposed facts, the difference between big and small hospitals. One, big hospitals do more than small ones. That is, uh, most if there's a treatment they do at a small hospital, they probably also do it at the big one. But if there's one they do at the big one, they may not do it at the small one because they just do a lot more kinds of things at the big hospital. That's fact number one. Fact number two is if you compare two hospitals that do the same thing, the one that does it more is better. You get a gunshot, you want to go to the place where they do a lot of gunshots, wherever the hospital is, whatever, you know, might not be in the rich suburban neighborhood, but you want the place where they do it a lot. So that's fact number two. You want to go to whichever place does the most. Now, these two facts together would suggest mm, big hospitals are better. They're doing the, you know, the better treatments and uh, they're doing each one more often and they're better at it. But in fact, on average, you're about, you get about the same outcome to a bigger, small hospital. And then the explanation is, well, those treatments that the big hospital do that the small ones don't are the new ones. And on average, new things are bad mm. because innovative process of innovation is you try a bunch of new things and you throw away most and you keep a small fraction of them. And the things the small hospitals are doing are the, the few that have lasted, that have been kept. The big hospitals are doing more new stuff. So then the recommendation for you is go to the big hospital and when they offer you some treatments, say, do they do that at the small hospital too? <laughs> and just pick only the ones they do at the small hospital <laughs> so that you're getting the better treatments by the people who do, do them more often. Nice. Great. I'd like to talk a bit about uh, incentives because that is, seems to be at the uh, part of the problem, sort of misaligned incentives or misallocation. Um, can you talk a bit about the incentive problems you see in healthcare? So Milton Friedman once said, fundamental reason that we have high healthcare costs are third party payments. Would you agree or disagree with Milton Friedman or what do you add to it? And what does he mean by that? Well, that's certainly a problem, but there's two levels of the problem. So think of auto repair, um, how you pick your auto repairer might affect how good a job they do and what they do. So if you just have a contract with your auto repair, where anytime something goes wrong, you take it, you think there's anything wrong, you take it to your repair person and they can say, oh, here's something. And they say, I recommend doing this for three, $300 and then you just do it. If that's your relationship to the auto repair person, you can guess that on the margin, they're going to say you need stuff that you don't need because you know, why not? You're going to pay for it. Right. Um, or if you had an auto repair person and they were just in charge of like repairing your car, no matter what happened for a certain fixed monthly fee, mm -hmm. well, uh, on the margin, they might look at things and go, you can do without that because they got to, they got to pay for everything and they don't get compensated on each thing. They just can't get paid per month. Right? So with an auto repair person, you might expect that the, the incentives you set up for them would affect quality of their work and like whether they did too much or too little on your car which I think we'd all make sense. And so similar issues are with respect to your medical providers. Um, you know, typical fee for service is the case where you just go in each time and they tell you what to do and you say, okay, and then you pay for it. And that's where you expect them to do too much. And then like capitation with a, uh, HMO would be more like the monthly fee where you expect them to do too little. So you can see from their point of view, you know, we might want to do better at the incentives we give them to give us advice, but that's the level of their incentives. I think there's actually a more important problem at the level of our incentives as we are basically not paying attention to medicine in an important way that we are actually paying more attention with auto repair. Um, so people do sometimes get mad and suspicious about auto bills and they switch their repair service. Uh, they switch cars, they, they, they do sometimes pay attention to the incentives they're giving and they check, say against, you know, get a second opinion. 
on their auto repair. They, they do. And there's other services like you would get a home contractor, remodel your bathroom. They might charge you too much. People get suspicious. They compare those things. But with medicine, they are just pretty unwilling to treat it critically. They, they mostly want to just put it out of their mind and decide they trust their doctor. And then not think about it. They are just really stressed and uh, find it very difficult to be critical and suspicious of their medical provider. It's not comfortable, especially in a situation where you're afraid about your own life and health. Um, so that means we just turn off our critical thinking uh, in the face of medicine, typically, and they know that. And so that makes the problem worse. That is, they feel pretty free to do whatever is in their financial and professional interest, et cetera, because we're just going to go along typically. And like when there's medical malpractice, sometimes we, we suspicious and then we, you know, then we get mad and then we sue and we lose 80% of the time. The doctors win 80% of metal malpractice suits, like, uh, because most of the jurors are like most people going, I got to trust the doctor. Yeah. Which is very insightful because that means Milton Friedman has been wrong, right? Because he meant to say that if you decide who you get care with, then you have better incentives to decide, right? So you make better decisions for your life. You're saying that's wrong. All right. We don't look at healthcare critically enough. So, um, instead what um, you've been suggesting in your work is look at providers of solutions and give them better incentives through like the, uh, payment schemes and things like that. Right. Well, so there's two parts of this and like if customers were willing to be suspicious of their doctors and willing to doubt and, you know, want to give them incentives or want to check their track records or want to get second opinions, if customers were willing to doubt, then I think I have ideas about what we could offer them that would address their doubts in a way that they could then, you know, given their limited information, actually use to get trustworthy service. What I don't know how to do is to get customers into that doubting frame of mind where they'd be willing to consider such things. That's the thing I'm less sure of, but it's a big world. And I think, you know, for any new guy, idea, we should maybe find some small group of people out there to try it and then it could spread. So I'm, there's probably some people, including people listening to this that are willing to doubt their doctors <laughs> for and sure. For them, let's consider what we could offer them that would give better incentives and then get some people to be happy with that and then hope it can spread. And not Sebastian, so. Sebastian always trusts his doctor. <laughs> of course. Yeah. I, it, it's funny how many doctors I meet who, who know so little about molecular biology and biochemistry that it, it seems criminal that they could, could provide this service to anybody. But yeah, it, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's the crowds I'm hanging out with, but I hear people say much more often, oh, my doctor is an idiot, uh, than, oh, I love my doctor. My doctor is so wise. So I'd be curious to know if we actually have data on like, how much people trust doctors. Um, it, it may be an education related thing. Uh, a lot of people who maybe are not as well educated, just kind of take, see doctor as, as a God, you know, like many doctors have God complexes to boot with their white coats and, and they just don't question. But um, yeah, I mean, one thing that concerns me that maybe we can touch upon that I've seen up close and personal is related to this technological stagnation hypothesis uh, with respect to biomedical science. So, you know, we've seen e even in the physical sciences, um, you know, speed of travel speed and, um, you know, all kinds of aspects about the real world, you know, especially when government is involved, stagnation, some since sometime in the seventies and I'm seeing something similar happening in biomedical science. So, you know, the Nixon declared the war on cancer in 1971 said, you know, within a decade we'll cure cancer. Other heads of the national cancer Institute have said similar things every decade. And yet it's sometimes said that progress in the field of oncology is everywhere, but the mortality statistics. And we've gotten like 5% extended healthy lifespan across the board of all cancer types. There are some rare exceptions, but um, generally not much progress has been made despite the fact that by far the most dollars and attention and talent, um, are, are in the oncology field, whether it's government funding or private industry, um, you know, double the amount of money goes to oncology than for cardiovascular disease, even though CVD is the leading cause of death. It kills 
almost twice as many people as cancer, right? And, and that's because of, you know, it's easier to make money in cancer, right? Basically. So, so yeah, you know, some of your colleagues have talked about technological stagnation. Have you um, thought about its applications to both biomedical research in the lab, as well as clinical research and, and healthcare provision? So um, Moore's Law is famously the name for computer chips and memory uh, getting cheaper over time. And there's this name where you reverse more into E-Room. E-Room's Law, yeah. And you call it E-Room's Law, which is the law by which the amount of money spent on new drugs is doubling at a scary rate. The term so, was coined by a friend of mine, Jack Scannell. He's uh, an active in the longevity space and the decentralized science space. And um, yeah, it's it's kind of crazy. And he he pointed this out in a series of papers in like Nature Biotech and Nature Reviews Drug Discovery. And he basically argues a lot of that failure is due to model validity. So um, basically the animal models of disease, these contrived animal models are not realistic. And that's why most drugs fail in phase two clinical trials. You know, you'll have these academics coming up with this contrived model of like Alzheimer's disease, these amyloid beta mice or mouse heimers. And you can find drugs that work in the mice, but that's not what's actually happening in the humans. And nobody seems to care because in academia, you just want to publish your paper and move on. And in pharma, as a rank and file pharma scientist, you just want to advance the molecule to the next phase of development. And you don't really care uh, if, if the drug succeeds. Back in the day, you used to get royalties from the drugs that you invented as a, as a pharmaceutical chemist, for example. So, so that's one aside. So as an economist, my diagnosis would be the usual thing that if the providers in some industry don't really have an incentive to serve the customers there, then their research incentives will be just to produce whatever it is that gets sold more, which mm -hmm. is, doesn't necessarily help customers walk. Uh, in addition, you can have just cases where like a research community just gets cut off from even the customers in an industry, even the producers where they just have some internal incentives where they're in charge of their own research funding. So both of those kinds of problems seem to be in medicine. That's so why I'm, I'm an academic and I know there's just academics are often, you know, a funding source gives money to academics to decide what academics should get money for. And then they just give money to themselves based on whatever criteria they've selected. And it doesn't really matter if it helps the world because they get their money and they get their prestige because they have their own world. So academia is just like that. Academia doesn't necessarily try to help the world, but then there might be commercial suppliers who might then more care about getting revenue from customers. But if the customers are not actually rewarding them for the thing the customer you know, might want, then the producers won't also, also won't be looking for helping the customers in that way. They'll be helping the, you know, for example, you know, we might say, you know, there are some movies that might be uplifting and informative about the world and other movies are just fun. If you, the customer just buys the fun movies, well, they're going to make fun movies and they're not going to make uplifting, informative movies because that's not what you're buying from them. So unfortunately in the world of medicine, the oncologists, um, are getting paid by their clients for just introducing new treatments that they say are the new treatments. And it doesn't that much matter if they're actually more effective because the patients aren't paying attention to that. So why should the oncologist pay attention to it if the customers aren't paying attention? And then, you know, then the for-profit drug companies will at least pay attention to what the oncologists want, but that won't be what the increase the lifespan because the customers are just not paying attention to those outcomes. And then of course the academics could be disconnected even from the customers or the oncologists because they have their own world of research and they just, whatever they decide is the quality research they just get money for. Um, yeah. so, you know, the, the, the solution here in general between economists would be first get the customer to actually care about the thing that supposedly they're buying and to pay attention to it, to find a way that the customer can relate to their suppliers such that they actually induce the suppliers to give them the things that they should want. Then of course, separately, we could try to fix research in terms of, you know, asking how do we run research so that I see that as a somewhat separate problem, which is a whole different kettle. But, uh, fundamentally, even if all academic research was wasted, if the oncologists are actually responding to customer demand for actually helping you not die, then that would go a long way toward them finding and producing better treatment, even if the academics were useless. 
Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we do rely on academia as the source of a lot of this innovation. Um, it, there does seem to be a problem at the level of FDA or the regulator, because most people think FDA is selecting the therapies that are most effective and deciding to recommend those, but it's actually medical guidelines, which in the U.S. are usually at the state level. Um, and these are sort of cartels of medical practitioners who often have conflicts of interest. You know, they're consulting for Pfizer or what have you. Um, and, but it's kind of too technical for most people to, to read all the literature and decide which therapy. So um, maybe there's another way to do it, which is like a third party auditor where like a private market auditor that reviews all of the data and they review the track record of the physicians and the patient actually pays this group well, in order to do the that analysis. Auditor to actually care too now. So, so, so people kind of know that they're not paying that much attention to medicine and they're not making good choices. So that's why they authorize a lot of regulation of medicine through professional licensing and the FDA, et cetera, under the belief that that regulation will ensure quality and effectiveness when their inattention won't. Um, mm -hmm. but they're just wrong about how regulation works. That is regulators only give customers the voters what they want if voters are paying enough attention to the regulators to discipline them. But it's even harder to pay attention to and discipline regulators than it is to do that for individual service providers. So, um, I would say, you know, the fundamental thing is we need, if we could give customers a, a way to buy medicine that they could trust, then they could realize they don't need all the regulation because they already have a more direct way to trust them. And then the regulation would be getting in the way which it often does now. So that's to me the key. How could you let a customer buy medicine in a way that they could believe that it was giving the provider a strong incentive to do the right thing? I to give you more when it's more is effective and less when more is not effective. Uh, and so I have an idea for how to do that, but whether my idea is right or wrong, that's the key in my mind is to make this more like a, so like most people trust restaurants they go to, in the sense of, you know, if I like the food, I'll come back. If I don't, like some things about safety that they can't see, they allow some regulation out. But most people think they don't need heavily regulation of restaurants because they can just tell if they like the food. So and there are many products like that for TV shows or whatever. You know, we don't need to regulate quality of TV shows. People believe that if they watch a TV show, they can figure out if they like it enough and then that's fine. So if we could do that sort of thing for medicine, assure the customer that they can tell and sort of directly that they have a relationship that's going to ensure this supplier is, is doing a good job, then we could cut back on the regulation and then we could have more disciplined researchers and, and everything else if we could do that key thing. But first we need to figure out a mechanism and I think I have an idea, but secondly, we need to make people care enough to be willing to adopt it. That's where maybe your rich friends who are more skeptical about their doctors would be the great place to start with those as customers and for them, let's make a product that they can believe in and then get it to spread to others. Good. Yeah. So you I alluded to this idea. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you could yeah. tell us what the, what this new idea is exactly. Okay. So the simple concept first is merge health and life insurance. So now when you die, your life insurance company loses a bunch of it. And Basically, so we talk about medicine as if it's really hard to tell the quality of medicine. And there's a sense which like, it's hard to know which treatments are good treatments. And that's why it's, you, you know, you're wondering whether you should be authorized regulation, but the main things you get out of medicine, you actually can observe. That is, you don't want to die. You don't want to be disabled. You don't want to be in pain. These are things you see after the fact. And so if we can tie their incentives to those outcomes, then you can trust that they have your interests at heart and trust them to make all these complicated technical choices you don't understand. We, what you need to know is that when bad things happen to you, bad things happen to them financially. So life insurance, when you die, they lose a lot of money. Secondly, disability. If you get disabled, they lose a lot of money. And third, maybe even pain, well, that's a little harder. You get a lot of pain, they lose a lot of money. So now, you know, when the bad things happen to you, it happens to them, 
And the last thing we just need to do is to set the levels of these things right. So the sign is right. That is, we want them to care on the margin in the right direction. But if you could make the magnitude of their suffering equal to the magnitude of your suffering, then when they were, if you just gave them a decision, you know, here's a treatment, do you think it's worth it? They would make the cost benefit trade off. Ah, uh, I'd have to pay this much for the treatment, but here's the chances it would reduce the risk of death or disability. And they would make a cost benefit trade off. And, you know, you agree on the cost, what well, you don't necessarily agree off its benefits, but if they suffered as much as you for these bad things, then they, you would agree. So for example, how much is your life worth to you, right? So say an estimate is like five or $10 million. So now if they lose $10 million when you die and you lose $10 million when you die now, if they're thinking of a, a, tri a treatment, let's say might save you, might kill you, but it costs something, they would make the same trade-off. So then the challenge is, well, usually most people who have a 10 million value of life, they don't have anybody they want to give $10 million when they die. So there's the question, how can we scale up the amount of life insurance to match their value of life, similarly for disability and pain? Uh, so, you know, if you have a spouse or somebody else that you want to give $1 million in insurance that helps toward this goal, there's still this difference. They suffer $1 million when you die and you suffer 10 million. Now, even that would solve a lot of problems. That is, there are a lot of medical treatment choices where getting within a factor of 10 would be good enough to get them to do the right thing. So I'm hopeful about even, even just the, the smaller insurance working to, to combine incentives. But if we want to go farther, what we really need to do is you need to buy a $10 million life insurance policy and then have 1 million go to your spouse because that's the one you're willing to pay for. And then have the 9 million go to another party who pays you for the privilege up front, lowering your premiums. And now the problem is this other party would want to hurt you while the medical <laughs> provider wants to help you. So last thing we need to do is make sure this party who would want to hurt you can't hurt you. <laughs> so it's anonymous. They don't know who you are. They don't know where you live. What they buy is a big package of these assets from thousands of people instead of just yours. Uh, they're, they're just a shell company somewhere who can't do anything anyway. We just do a couple of things like that to make sure whoever is this other beneficiary for the remaining insurance can't hurt you. We make sure you medical provider, they do know who you are. They, they meet with them. They are authorized to, to help you out and give you medicines and they want to help you. And so they do help you. And so we do that for life insurance and disability and pain insurance. And now the idea is you don't need to inspect their professional licenses or whether their, their drugs have been approved by randomized trials or something. You can see they have your interest at heart directly. That is when bad things happen to you, bad things happen to them. And they know a lot more than you about these things. So you might as well let them choose. Now, there's always going to be detail about like, say there's a rash and it's itchy, right? You know, how much pain does that count for? And, you know, some standard product is going to estimate a standard aversion to itchy rashes, and maybe you're more averse to itchy rashes than the average person, right? So this system isn't going to get that. It's not going to get down to that level of detail of your preference for other things, but we're looking to, we have a really bad system here. Remember on the margin, it's not helping. So we need to fix this really big, bad mismatch of incentives. And then once we can fix that, maybe we can think about some other things to fine tune these, you know, how much you care about your rash. To what degree yeah. Yeah. have you I've... observed, because I know, Robin, you've been advocating that idea for a while. Um, to what degree is it a problem getting insurance companies to do that? And just for backgrounds, it seems to me that insurance is a bit of a stranded technology. Like the title of the podcast, it's very hard to start a new one, right? So the costs to start a new insurance company are very, very high because you need all sorts of carrier licenses and like and uh, capital to kind of underwrite the risk that is required by your jurisdiction. So as a startup, you have to raise something like, you know, 10 or 50 million uh, in kind of equity and capital that you can't like use to operate your company, which is a prohibitive barrier for new startups that might come with new ideas. I was wondering what your observations are in sort of getting something like that off the ground. Insurance is a heavily regulated industry. 
that's right off the bat an obstacle. And it's regulated in part via exactly those capital requirements. That's going to discourage investment. Um, the, the best pitch would be to go to existing insurance companies to get them to offer these alternative products that, you know, rather than getting someone to start up a whole new venture, um, they've already paid all those costs. Uh, now you just have to convince them to switch. Now, um, in the United States, we have different regulatory regimes for life insurance and health insurance, and that's an obstacle to this merging because for example, it's life insurance. You certainly are allowed to underwrite and offer different prices based on different histories. And you're not allowed to do that anymore in the health insurance market. So that would be an obstacle mm. to merging these products because they, what you're allowed to price them on is different in those two cases. Also insurance companies, like they have in some sense in the past offered these two things, but just as an administrative convenience, their pitch is just, Hey, you have to buy a bunch of different insurance. Why don't you just buy them all from us? And, you know, we'll do the paperwork fewer times, right? And that's how they're seeing the advantage of merging these things. They aren't, they haven't tried to do it in terms of the incentives. Um, in part because, uh, insurance companies are actually kind of shy about admitting that they have substantial control over treatment. Um, be because in fact, you know, people were mad in the past when they heard that insurance companies were regulating treatment. The story most people want to hear is the doctor makes the choice about treatment and the insurance company pays for it. If the insurance company is messing, which with treatments you get, then that's a bad thing to be avoided, which makes insurance companies shy about advertising that we are influencing the treatment through this incentives. And that's good for you. Like that's, that's a marketing stuff. That's a bit risky for them. Yeah, but I think you're, um, underestimating how hard it is to convince established big companies, right? It's very rare that innovation is coming from that. That's why we have startups, right? And it's typically the case that in any industry, like the, um, the amount of innovation you get is very closely correlated, almost a direct result of the amount of freedom that suppliers and buyers have in entering that industry, right? So I think what we really need is new startups. Um, and also since last time we talked, Robin and Sebastian as well, we've been doing a lot of work, right? So um, we looked at special economic zones and other jurisdictions. We have brought a lot of attention to the space in the longevity and DSI community. We'll have several bigger conferences, one this year, November 17 to 19. That's already filling up quickly, even though I'm not even promoting it, right? So Sebastian um, and I, we've done a lot of work. Also, Vita Dao, instead of creating awareness, hey, let's go to places where we can choose our own regulation or do different regulation, like in Prospera, kind of where we are already doing clinical trials and where we also have the ability to write sort of a new set of regulations for insurance, I'm working with someone, have someone on the podcast soon named Matthew Queen, who wrote a book about sort of creating a different, how you could create a different jurisdiction, a different set of regulations that would improve on what's now being used, which is Vermont and Bermuda. So we can start a movement. We have the resources to put more startups to the starting line and trialing out some of these solutions. Robin, we've already talked separately. There's a company that I've invested in that's actually interested in implementing the scheme. So I'd love to talk about solutions. What can different strategies be to implement that solution if we can start from a more clean slate, right? So should we start and what are the challenges that we need to overcome, right? So can we start up market, like you said, with very rich people who are kind of um, more educated and would like to buy this argument? Could we maybe start somewhere at the bottom with people that are not yet insured? and kind of, you know, make insurance for them accessible in the first place, which is what this other company is doing. Where, where's your mind at when it comes to trialing out new things from a blank slate? So what Sebastian mentioned about heavy regulation of treatment choices, this doesn't work unless there's a context where you're allowed to admit that you have discretion in treatment choices. That is the whole pitch is I have this in financial incentive to be right for you. And therefore I will make discretionary choices in your favor. If the fiction is I'm following a rule book and I don't have discretion, then there's no point in paying them to use their discretion in your favor. So you'd need some jurisdiction where it's more accepted that doctors have discretion that they will use and that it's okay that their financial incentives are the basis for that. And so 
you know, you have to find a group of people in a jurisdiction where that's true. So there's first, there's where the insurance company is set up, but then there's where the patients are and what the regulation of medicine in that place is. And so if, you know, is it people living in Prospera that are the customers that can bring them there, right? So, or, or, right. Or are they living somewhere else and they come here temporarily so that, you know, you know, the, the, the general plan is simpler if it's just all of your medicine. If we say, well, we just do the extra bespoke medicine with good incentives. Well, now we're like, well, who decides which is the extra bespoke medicine, and which is the regular medicine that makes a harder line to draw. Yeah. Um, so I like this, this, uh, approach implementing, it could be a little difficult, but, um, but I'd, I'd love to support it in, in whatever way. One thing that I keep coming back to is where is the locus of control or decision making? And I'd say, yeah, this new structure gives the insurance companies renewed incentive to care, but I'd say the patient and or their family, uh, and maybe the doctor who has a track record for, for patient outcomes, uh, have a strong incentive too. And so maybe there's a way that we could put the control in the hands of the level of, in the hands of the patient. So like, for example, we talked about this at Zuzalu. The kind of health insurance that I would like is not one where I have to follow this prescribed sequence of therapies. Like if I got cancer tomorrow, I probably would not take the standard of care, chemotherapy and radiation that would maybe give me some six months of extended lifespan. But, you know, it's often said that, you know, you, you try to kill the cancer before you kill the, ca the patient with the chemo because it's medieval, these approaches. So, so I probably wouldn't go the traditional chemotherapy route. I'd, I'd want to search around for alternatives that maybe aren't offered in the United States, offered in Switzerland or, or somewhere else. Uh, at, at least I'd like to try them first. And then the standard of care is a last resort, maybe. So what I would like is an insurance product where I pay in a certain premium and then I get a payout of X amount of dollars that I can spend as I see fit or I and my doctor or the doctor, as well as a third party agency that is responsible for reviewing medicines. So like the Cochrane collaboration is one that used to be relatively unbiased. They've been a little bit co-opted. Uh, there's one called the Environmental Working Group that analyzes groundwater and cosmetic products and things like that. And there, there are similar ones for electronics to make sure your electronics don't explode. So, so one of the problems I keep coming back to as a libertarian is government monopoly on regulation of all sorts. And FDA seems to have all kinds of problems in that respect, even if you assume that they're mostly acting in good faith, which is a big assumption um, with a revolving door and all. Um, they, they make these terrible mistakes. So like one mistake that that's come up in the news recently is this amyloid beta antibody, the series of drugs that target Alzheimer's disease, this one protein called the amyloid beta, which academia and pharma, uh, largely thought drove Alzheimer's disease. It turns out that there was this sort of organized cabal of academics, uh, that were suppressing alternative theories. This is how paradigm shifts in science work. And, and there's a good article about this from Stat News, one of the leading healthcare uh, publications about this so-called Alzheimer's cabal, you know, prominent people at Harvard and so forth, sweeping under the rug alternative uh, explanations for Alzheimer's disease. And so, um, you know, billions of dollars have been spent, you know, 20, 30 years of research on Alzheimer's totally stalled and, and almost nothing worked because we were so over-indexed on this one hypothesis. And recently, FDA approved two different amyloid beta targeting therapies, uh, even though they, they hardly work. And one was approved against the advice of their own advisory committee. So they have a committee of about 10 academics, prominent ones who review the data, and they pretty much all said, no, don't approve it. Their own internal statistician at FDA said, don't approve it. They went ahead and did so anyway. And then the Department of Justice launched uh, an inquiry into the degree of coziness between FDA officials and Biogen, the, the sponsor of that drug. Um, and then they more recently approved a, a, another similar drug. Um, and, and so some of these insurers say, hey, we're not going to reimburse for this. We don't think it works. So that's sort of a quality control step. But it's kind of this larger prog problem of like concentration of, uh, of, of approaches. And so anything that we can do to let a thousand flowers bloom um, I, I would like to see more of that. And so, I mean, there's obviously a risk if you have sort of cowboy doctors trying crazy stuff, but I think we should probably give a little bit more credit to individuals and their families and, and their advisors around them for deciding who's actually a good doctor who knows what they're talking about. But yeah, maybe you have some ideas to put power in the hands of patients. So I'm a teacher and in many schools, uh, the 
final tests that give the grade of students are not produced by the teacher. They're produced separately. And that's a good discipline. Uh, if you let the teacher produce their own tests or their own results, then it's hard to evaluate the teacher because they produce each produce different tests. Um, so a separation between, you know, who evaluates and who, who tells you you have a problem and who tells you have a solution would be a good idea, similar to separating who teaches and who evaluates the teaching, Yeah, you know? So an ordinary insurance product that just gives you money to the doctor to both diagnose your problem and to suggest what to do, it might be healthier to separate those two roles. You, mm -hmm. you have some di doctor who diagnoses the problem and some other doctor who treats it. And then your insurance could trigger on the first doctor telling you have this diagnosis and then you get a payment and then you can decide what to do with it. And that would put more competition in that mo last moment where I've got the money and now the question is, what do I spend it on? Um, and I don't have to spend it all. I can teach all of it. Mm. And that would be a good incentive to ask, is any of this treatment any good? Yeah. Um, but we do have to then separate these doctors who are not typically separated. That is typically the person who diagnoses your problem also recommends treatment. And that's mixing up these two roles, in which case, uh, you know, yeah. when those roles are mixed up, then it's going to be hard for you to take that money and take it somewhere else because this doctor is going to be mixing up their diagnosis and their treatment recommendation in order to keep the money with them. Yeah, exactly. And it's not even at the level of the doctor, right? It's at the level of the medical guidelines, which many doctors don't agree with, but they have to comply with it by law. Um, and so that really restricts their, their ability to try something new. And so people will do medical tourism. They'll go abroad to many different countries and jurisdictions. And, um, and, and one thing that's really impressed me is that people are paying out of pocket for all kinds of alternative, uh, non-orthodox approaches or approaches that are too new to be approved by certain regulators. Maybe they're available in Japan or, uh, somewhere in Europe, but they're not yet available in the United States. And one example is regenerative medicine, stem cell therapy. So, you know, many athletes, for example, will use mesenchymal stem cell injections for uh, injuries uh, or people using it for osteoarthritis. It actually works very well and it's, and it's very safe. Um, you just take out some of your own fat, isolate these mesenchymal stem cells, re-inject them, and you can do other things ex vivo to try to improve their function too. Um, and yet very, very little of this can be done in the United States because of these prohibitive regulations. So there's this sort of distinction between certificatory and prohibitive. We've discussed this previously. Prohibitive means FDA and EMA can basically say, if we have not already approved something and you haven't paid the hundreds of billions required to run the studies to our, to our pleasure, um, you know, your doctor can lose a license if they, if they facilitate you getting that therapy, um, versus a certificatory approach where they say, Hey, we've checked this out. We think it's good. We would endorse this for insurance companies to reimburse or whatever. Um, so I don't know if there are any regulators anywhere in the world that do the certificatory approach, these monopoly government regulators. Um, so, so what's your take on, on that distinction between prohibitive and certificatory? Um, my job talk paper long ago was about the difference between product warnings and bans. Mm. Uh, that is, you know, logically it might seem if the government knows something the rest of us don't know, they could communicate that information through warnings and then they wouldn't need to restrict our activity. And so then it becomes somewhat of a puzzle why we have so many, in effect, product bans instead of product warnings. Um, and so I spent a lot of years thinking that through and coming up with considerations. And I, I do think we have some ideas why that is sometimes when, so for example, um, uh, when I gave this job talk long ago, someone told me that this example of they were hiking in the woods and they came across a creek that had rapid flow of water. They wondered if it was safe to cross. And they saw a sign that says dangerous rapids, you know, stay away, but they didn't see a fence. And they said to themselves, oh, a sign, but no fence. How bad could it be? <laughs> so they went in the water and almost drowned. But the point is we often interpret a warning without a ban as an endorsement in the sense that when pe people do typically ban worse things, very bad things. And then sometimes they just give you a warning. And then when we hear the warning, we go, it can't be that bad because they didn't do the ban. And that induces people sometimes to have to do the ban. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a rational sort of, that would work for rational agents as a way to induce bads. It's not clear that that's actually the main reason causing bad, but this is a long time issue for libertarians and many others, which is 
why can't, if the government knows things, why can't they just tell us what they know and let us make choices afterwards? Um, but you know, whatever is the answer to that, it still seems like, you know, the world isn't equally highly regulated. That is, we have a highly regulatory society, but it's regulating some things much more than others. And medicine is one of the most highly regulated things we have. So it's worth trying to ask what's the difference between the things we highly regulated and the things we less highly regulated. And it does seem that most people fear that they don't know enough to make choices and they might make choices badly given their usual load and that they want somebody else supposedly to step in and help them with the choice. And that's the rationale for the regulation. And then for whatever reason, they don't just want warnings and advice. They, they want restrictions. But if we could somehow reassure people that they have a handle on this, that they don't have to just trust somebody to fix it for them, then the hope is that we could then cut back on the regulation. But the problem is that regulation prevents many of the, uh, you know, innovation attempts that would then maybe solve the problem. That is once the government's there, not letting you do stuff, how are you supposed to show people that you don't need the government there to protect you? There's another way to protect you, but if you, you know, nobody lets you try the other way, then you're stuck. Yeah. Which is why I tend to think that solving the regulatory monopoly thing could be very beneficial, right? Because you can still maybe not outright ban things, but you can make it very expensive to do certain things that sort of regulators have agreed on are not a very good thing to do, right? So there's a very strong sort of um, presumption against doing certain things. You have a regulation that insurers agreed on, that arbitrators agreed on. So most like medical clinics are abiding by that. But sort of if you have a regulatory flexibility, you say, all right, I can come up kind of with my own regulation as long as I find an insurer that is willing to um, to ensure that, right? And I'm sort of um, have very high liabilities if something goes wrong or if I commit a crime or something like that. That system, if there's some innovation on the margin, you can kind of capture that can do things differently. So there's a basic problem here that we find a jurisdiction where you're allowed to do more, right? Great. And then for many people, the first thing they want to do there is, oh, I want to do the stuff there that's not allowed in my usual jurisdiction. That's the win. But from my mind, that's not the win. <laughs> like, usually we're just doing way too much of everything. The problem is to do less. So going to a place where you are allowed to do whatever you want and then doing more is not in my mind, likely to produce the successful track record that makes people want to emulate that. I want to make a successful track record where people say, look over there, they're just as healthy and they're paying a lot less. Let's copy them. So I would like a place where you're free to do less. And then they have a track record of doing a lot less, but not suffering for it because the less they're doing isn't really stuff you wanted anyway. So I'm not, I'm, I'm less excited by the, oh, we're going to go here and do these other extra things. They're banned elsewhere, but we think they're great. I mean, there must be some things like that, but on average, that's the wrong direction. The better direction is to show people that you can just do a lot less and it's okay. Uh, I mean, it's create a track can, can it be so both? less about particular treatments. Go ahead. Can't it be both, right? Because Sebastian already mentioned stem cell treatments and things like that, right? I mean. There definitely are going to be some treatments that we should be doing that are better, but the overall tendency is we're just doing way too much. So the overall effect I need to expect is I want to see a place where you're allowed to do way less. You know, rich people who are sensitive and care about their health are willing to spend a lot less and show that they are just as healthy. That would be the big win. That would be the thing that might entice other people to copy them. And there are stories like that. People like they Singapore, look, they spend a lot less, but uh, they seem pretty healthy. And, you know, but how do you copy Singapore? <laughs> so the problem is like all these different national variations, there's all these things that vary between nations. So what would be yeah. nice is to show in, in like a randomized trial, even in some place in Roatan or wherever it is, look in this place, these people were randomly assigned to the usual thing and they did a lot. And these people were randomly assigned to do a lot less. And you know what? They were just as fine and they spend a lot less. And it was because we had this incentive to show, to, to get them to make better choices. Yeah. It will be difficult in, yeah. in Rotan or in Prospera because, you know, we want to build like a, 
because it seems to me that people would be coming to get treatments and not to get no treatments, right? Why would you go, go to a different place? So you'd have to rather, but we could think of something instead like a spillover, right? To the rest of the island of Roatan or to the rest of Honduras, right? So we are already seeing startups, healthcare tech startups that are working with us here. So we could kind of prove that effect in, in a larger jurisdiction, right? Maybe I can just outline the problem a little bit. Uh, engineers often say, you know, you should uh, spend 90% of your time describing the problem and then the solution will pop out shortly after. So um, part of the problem is there seems to be this cartelization of uh, what therapies are available because the pharmaceutical industry has this revolving door with the regulators. It's kind of like banks and the SEC kind of thing. So there are therapies that work that we can't get access to in the United States because the pharmaceutical industry has created these very expensive barriers to getting new drugs approved such that only they can afford to get the new drugs approved because you need like a hundred million dollars to do a phase three study for, for large scale indications. Um, and so no, you know, doctor, even if suppose there was a doctor who found the cure for cancer, you know, he's got a hundred case studies of a cure for cancer, uh, or Alzheimer's, uh, but he just can't raise the money to, uh, develop this as a drug because it's probably not patentable or it's a combination of things or for whatever reason, pharma is not interested. There's no mechanism in the United States or in Europe to uh, achieve mass market availability of these kind of therapies. Similar logic applies to generic drugs repurposing or drugs that are approved in one jurisdiction like Japan or Eastern Europe, uh, but, but can't get a sponsor in the United States because the IP is stale. There's no patent for it. So there are all kinds of cases of people um, you know, who want access to these therapies but can't get them, and that's why these medical jurisdictions have sprung up everywhere. Um, and, but it's inconvenient and there's no one hub for that. So we want to set one up in Prospera and we'll have our own sort of certificatory market regulator, the Prospera medical authority or whatever we'll call it. Um, so people have some, some surety that the therapy works. Um, and, and so one example that, that we discussed at Zuzalu, um, is Dallas Buyers Club. So there was this case where there were therapies. Um, and there was a movie made about it with Matthew McConaughey therapies in development for AIDS, HIV. Um, and you know, Fauci at all, uh, were slow to approve them. Um, they were later approved, but you know, people were dying in the meantime. Uh, and so there was a guy who smuggled the drug from Mexico into the United States and ultimately was pursued by the FDA, uh, Gestapo. Well, the same thing is happening all over the United States with all kinds of other diseases. Um, there are doctors who have a therapy that they think works and their, their patients, you know, voluntarily want to try it and the FDA knocks and shuts them down if they're doing that. So we would just like a sort of a, an incubator, a sandbox where it's safe to do these therapies. Um, and we'll have some level of quality control for the, the types of practitioners that can be there. Um, and, and we think that will turbocharge, uh, medical research. So that's the basic premise. My colleague, Alex Tabarrok, I know has recommended, you know, this policy where if any of a certain list of companies, nations approve a drug or then mm -hmm. your nation automatically approves it. So that would certainly solve this general problem of, of making it too hard to approve because, you know, you could pick some really good nations on the list. You think, well, look, Spain approves it. Spain isn't some backwards, you know, fly by night organization. <laughs> then if Spain approves it, let's us approve it too. Um, so that, that would go a long way toward that problem. And it's just, a we already have that problem here that we medical really reciprocity. That. There's like a list of 30 OCD countries that are basically by default, you can right. select or opt into these regulations. So that's already kind of the legal infrastructure for that there. Yeah. Yeah. There's another issue, which is these monopoly regulators, FDA and EMA, they sit on top of the largest markets. So, you know, it's all well and good for a company to show, you know, with some case studies that it's working in Prospera, but in order to have the kind of data that would justify one of these, uh, large legacy country regulators approving it, you have to comply with their requirements. And so, so it's not totally obvious to me how, how we could get around that. Um, but something I wanted to bring up while we, while we have some time is, uh, the work of Terrence Keeley. So we will have Terrence Keeley on the podcast, uh, quite soon. You may be familiar with him. Robin, he was at the Cato sure. Institute uh, for the audience. He's an uh, Oxford-trained um, clinical biochemist. He was uh, vice chancellor at University of Buckingham, et cetera. And he's kind of a thorn in the side of the standard 
um, uh, academia uh, who wants um, the the flow of state funded uh, research dollars in, in perpetuity. So his basic argument um, is that state government funding of research is actually uh, not neutral to progress, but deleterious. It's, it restricts progress. Um, and the mechanism he describes is crowding out. So you have only so many, you know, IQ top 0.01% people in the population. If you stick them in the ivory tower and you have them fight amongst themselves over trivialities, or they're restricted in the research funding they can get because they're all getting it from the government and they want to make sure that they don't upset the government and they're staying in their lane with orthodoxy in academia, um, then it basically prevents our best and brightest from actually contributing uh, to the real world. Whereas prior to, to the government funding of research, they would have been an industry. And he points to the Industrial Revolution as an example. Uh, you know, this was before governments funded research and we had all this advancement in steam engines and the like. And then the field of thermodynamics came about after the fact of all of these engineers tinkering in their garages and so forth. So, so these are some of the arguments that he puts forward. I would like to add one more piece, which is dogma. This is the most dangerous thing that I see in academia, which is academia, you know, maybe at one point was uh, a haven for sort of um, uh, independent thinking, heterodox Aspies. Uh, but now it's become like this, this um, political organization where it just has people who know how to toe the line. Um, and, and, you know, it begs the question where are these independent thinkers going to end up? Uh, maybe in startup world to some extent, but um, so so th these are some of the questions I see with academia. You know, the dogma, the crowding out. Um, do you see any hope on the horizon? Any alternative uh, ideas that may remedy this? So, I mean, Terence is probably basically right, as is many civil organs. But this is basically a classic, simple libertarian argument, which, while plausibly true, is just a hard swallow for most people. So the argument is basically, look, here's this good purpose that you want to serve. And if you give money to the government, they're going to try to serve this purpose. And you can see why maybe there'd be problems for the private sector achieving this purpose. And the government is there to fix the problems of the private sector by achieving this purpose that you know is good. And they're good people and they have good motives. And so they'll just do the good thing and, and solve your problem. And as we know, like, that's not quite how it works. That is government agencies who are authorized to solve the problem with the budget. They don't actually have to solve the problem. What they have is some organizations they try to grow and they play politics with each other. They, you know, have clients in the world who support them and they support back. And it can just be true that large government agencies and projects funded for good purposes don't achieve those purposes and in fact hurt those purposes. That's a sad fact about the world that libertarians kind of get. And economists often get, but most of the world just doesn't get. And honestly, even most economists are pretty reluctant to believe that. They, they tend to want to give these things the benefit of the doubt. So, for example, antitrust law plausibly hurts more than it helps. Professional licensing plausibly hurts more than it helps. There's a, just a lot of government things which have good justifications. There are good rationales why it might be the sort of thing you would want to do and why, if you give them money, they could do it. But you don't realize how hard it is to give them incentives to actually do it. Like the regular, sort of basically the democratic incentive is we notice they're doing bad jobs, so we fire them, right? But how are we going to notice that the antitrust organization is doing a bad job or the FDA is doing a bad job? We just don't have a very access to a good source of a track record that would assure us that, hey, they're just doing a bad job or they're better to be fired. And this is just a basic problem with our relationship with government. We need a relationship with government, which doesn't rely on our all collecting this information about whether any one agency is doing a good or bad job. So I have a proposal for reforming government called Futarchy, which you may have heard of, and it would solve that problem, but I don't know how to get people to care enough about the problem with the government to switch to it or even to do substantial trials. There. Uh, and again, I know how to identify problems in the world and design fixes. What I don't know how to do is make ordinary people care enough to allow them to be tried or to, you know, create and participate in trials so that we could, you know, get a track record of showing that these alternatives actually help. Yeah. Well, like uh, Alex Traberg once said, almost any problem that you point out in healthcare is probably true, right? <laughs> um, 
But what matters more is to find actual solutions. And as you know, Robin, we've embarked on that journey. We're in early stages, but we already have some things to show for. And we are, you know, using things like, um, you know, reg regulatory flexibility, private government, something that you've written about to, well, basically use the startup approach to some of these problems, right? So prove that it works on a small scale and then potentially scale it on a, on a bigger scale, right? So things like future key, things like different regulations for insurances, things like the certificatory approach. So we are just for our listeners who are quite familiar with that. Um, we will also embark sort of on a bigger journey to achieve density here in Prosper specifically with like 200 um, longevity aligned people to come from, from crypto, from science, from engineering to well create uh, these models anew, right? So we have created a lot of awareness of that. We're very closely listening to your ideas, Robin and Sebastian, and we're trying some of them out. Right. And our goal is to make this a bigger movement. Right. So it won't only be Prospera. Maybe in 10 years, we can have 50 different jurisdictions like that. We have learned a lot. We have um, now the templates and experience to negotiate with governments. We know what kind of legal things we need to get to make these things work. So we're experimenting and trying and doing things. Um, question to both of you What else would you like to give listeners along the way to? Um, to start working on these things, to start thinking about how they can use some of your ideas in, in their lives or, or, start, or get to start working on them. Maybe, uh, maybe Robin first, that's a question. I think I've gotten a lot of attention, you know, space here to explain some of my ideas. Yeah. I, I mentioned Futarchy, I mentioned the insurance proposal. I have some other variations, the uh, tax career agents, I think is promising. Um, but I guess I would say that, that the thing we most need in the world is just small scale experiments in many of these ideas. And most people are really very motivated to argue and tweet or comment on politics and in, in the world and its problems, but people are not very motivated to actually try specific things. So I just want to have each of you pause and ask, well, could you be part of a thing where you tried something and it doesn't have to be that complicated or, or expensive. There's just lots of ideas in the world that need some trying. And, uh, if more, a lot more people were trying ideas, we just have a lot more successful ideas to pick from, to get things, to make the world better. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, definitely agree on the experimentation as a scientist by training. Um, you know, experimentation is how we've advanced society. It's really been technology that's advanced everything. It's not necessarily new ideas. The ideas follow from the new technologies like the printing press. I'm, I'm relatively optimistic because of new, um, you know, developments related to the internet, uh, Bology's network state idea, I think is promising, uh, the charter cities or free cities or startup societies movement or competitive governance I like as well. Um, there's an upcoming conference, uh, Prague in about a month, Liberty in our lifetime about some of these ideas for how we can improve not just medicine, but every other, uh, aspect of human activity. Um, book recommendations. Um, there's a book that Balaji uh, endorsed uh, about the FDA called Power and Reputation uh, and, and many other books about FDA. Um, there, there are a lot of books that are a wealth of criticism, but maybe lacking in solutions. Um, and so this uh, Startup Society's Solution, I think, is the best one that I've heard, uh, where we just kind of have a high IQ, well-run uh, private state that people can opt into and, and out of more easily. Um, and another uh, aspect that I've devoted my life and career to uh, is longevity biotech. So I'm in the longevity field. We're developing new medicines that are actually good for you, that prevent diseases by preventing aging itself. And this is the elixir of life. And it turns out that it's not science fiction. We can actually extend healthy lifespan in mice and many other lab animals by up to about 50%, five zero with no negative side effects. Um, and we're just getting started in this field. We've only really been doing it for about 20 years. It's been quite fringe up until maybe the last 10 years in academia and industry. And now billions of dollars are coming into the space, very prominent names and thinkers. So that gives me some optimism in that, you know, part of the reason why it's so hard to make medical advances is 
like the corruption and competence and bad incentives that we've discussed, but also that biology is actually quite hard. And uh, part of it is because we pick the low hanging fruit. So, you know, with antibiotics and sanitation and the rest, we cure the diseases that were killing most of us in the turn of the 20th century, which were infectious diseases. And we've hit this wall, you know, in our 80s, let's say, where we're running against up against aging itself. And most of the diseases that kill us in the West are age related diseases where aging is your number one risk factor. And so um, I think there will be a revolution in the next couple of decades if we're successful in the long bio field where we won't just be palliating the symptoms of late stage pathology, cutting off the heads of the mythological hydra, but actually striking at its heart um, by targeting the biology of aging itself. And we know, you know, many of the mechanisms, the underlying cellular and biochemical mechanisms that drive aging, and yet almost nobody is working on it. It's like less than 0.01% of the NIH budget. Um, and so, you know, this seems to be a serious misalignment in serious market failure. And thankfully, we're starting to see companies coming in the space. We invest in these companies through Healthspan Capital, my venture fund, we're the most active investor in this space. Um, but it's really not enough capital and talent. So uh, for anyone who's interested in longevity, um, please, you know, reach out to myself or some of the other people in the space and tell your, uh, tell your um, unelected bureaucrats and, and elected uh, leaders that longevity is something that you want to see more of. Fantastic. Robert, Sebastian, um, both of you have been huge inspirations to me and very impactful also on my work and on the things we're starting to build. And I know we'll be working closely together to further this because now things are starting to get exciting. So for any listener who wants to join us in the journey, I'll point out two dates, November 17 to 19, Longevity and Desai Summit in Prospera. Um, Aubrey de Grey is headlining as a speaker. And then Vitalia starting the Frontier City of Life, also in Prospera in all of January and Feb, basically using Zuzalu as a template, focused specifically on longevity. So exciting things are happening on the, and on the horizon. So thank you so much, Sebastian and Robin for coming again on the show. This was epic. Great. Thanks for having me. Thanks guys. Nice to see you.